Welcome to Green Planet, Blue Planet podcast. I'm here today with Deborah Rosman and Howard Martin from the HeartMath Institute. Deborah, you're the president and co-CEO of HeartMath Inc. and also the co-author of Heart Intelligence. And uh, welcome to the show, Howard. You're also a co-author of uh, Heart Intelligence and the executive vice president of HeartMath Inc. I'd love to understand from you guys, just to kick off this conversation, what can we understand as Heart Intelligence? Good to see you, Julian and Deborah. And um, I want to thank everybody who's giving some of their time and attention and their most likely busy lives to listen to our conversation today, wherever you're listening from all around the world, either live right now with all of us or in, in, in the coming days. So, Julian, you ask what is hard intelligence? Well, maybe rather than define it, let me go ahead and, and describe it, you know, what it is. And as I do, maybe listeners can get a sense of that for themselves, feel that in their own hearts as I describe heart intelligence. To me, it's the core of our authentic self, you know, that part that's real to us, not the personality side that's, you know, this built upon assumptions about who we are or about what we think people want us to be. But that deeper core authentic us is where heart intelligence really resides. It's an intelligence that's really high speed. It's intuitive in nature. It allows us to reach understanding quicker with more clarity. It's an intelligence that looks out more for the whole. You know, it takes more things into consideration as a sort of a wider range of discrimination in that type of intelligence. When we're in touch with the heart's intelligence, that's when we have a deeper connection with ourselves, but also with others. You may, people may be able to identify with times in their life when they had great conversations with people they didn't know. There was a resonance. There was a connection heart to heart that allowed for a very rich conversation to occur without having to know about their lives, about where they worked or who they were or any of that. We've all had those experiences. And to me, that's hard intelligence manifesting in a connection that we have with other people, with all living systems. It's also the intelligence that gives birth to some of the emotional qualities that we really revere the most. You know, emotions like care or compassion or appreciation or love, to me, they're birthed by the intelligence of the heart, this sort of core intelligence that gives rise to that type of emotional quality. Heart intelligence is a source of our self-security. It's a place that we go to when we need to find answers to challenges that we just can't figure out through logical linear intelligence. That's when we do dig a little deeper. It's when we pray or we meditate. We take that walk in the woods or we drive out in the car into the night to reach understanding. We dig into what I would call the intelligence of the heart, heart intelligence. The last thing I'll say about it in a descriptive context before I give it to Deborah is that one thing, Julian, that I've learned all these years about it is it's pretty simple. My heart's intelligence is my own best friend. It's the most reliable guy that I have and have ever had for making decisions in life, whether they be big decisions or moment to moment, day to day decisions. And that's the beauty uh, and majesty, I think, of the heart's intelligence is its, its ability to give us that inner security, that strength and that clarity and to feel like it's your own best friend. And to me, that's uh, some of what heart intelligence means to me. Thank you, Howard. I'm going to answer that question from a whole different perspective. It'll help explain the underlying physiology behind what Howard was talking about. This heart intelligence and all the wonderful qualities he was talking about can still sound philosophical even though most of us have had some reference to what that might mean. But what's exciting is to see the research that's now validating that the heart is an intelligent system. It's actually an information processing system, the physical heart I'm talking about. And that has only come to light to physiologists in the last 30, 40 years. It's amazing that everyone is looking up in the brain for intelligence, realizing without realizing that the cells, the body, but especially the heart have their own intelligence systems. And the heart's unusual because it has what's called a little brain in the heart or an intrinsic nervous system, neurons that can feel, learn, see, and remember, and that operates independent from the brain and the head. So right there, you have an intelligence system in the heart, independent of the ups upstairs. But we have learned through our research with the HeartMath Institute over the years and our work with all sorts of people in society that heart intelligence is really what you experience when there's a flow of intuition. Some people call it a download, a flow of intuitive information that happens when the mind, emotions, and physiology or brain, heart, and nervous system are brought into coherent alignment. 
with the heart. And the heart is actually driving that process. Even if the brain mind goes, oh, I need to go to my heart for my answer. That action of going to the heart and going deep in the heart or playing with your heart or put your heart into it, all the metaphors of the heart, of activating the heart, they are actually activating a different communication between the heart and the brain and the body that allows us to move into more of that intuitive flow state. So we, if we define it, we define heart intelligence as, is the state of flow that can happen when the mind and emotions and nervous system are brought into intuitive or coherent. That's a term we use a lot, alignment physiologically with the heart and the rhythms of the heart. That could go more into the science, but I wanted to add that there really is a scientific underpinning to what's been talked about for millennia, about the power and wisdom of the heart and what Howard was talking about in terms of what the heart can do and be for each of us as the, our best friend, our, our still small voice, the place we go to for security and comfort. Beautiful. I love both of these angles. And I think this is really what drew me towards the HeartMath Institute in the first place a couple of years ago is that I think we can all personally relate to the wisdom of the heart. And um, let's go a little bit deeper into that as we're progressing in the, in the show. But also, I think it, it is clearly we're in times of, of like a very scientific age. So we like to understand things through our brain as well and prove that this is not just a notion or something that um, some of us feel, but that is something we can agree on. And this is, is a reliable source of information. And what's so interesting in your work is that we've understood now that the heart sends so much more information to the brain than vice versa. And the heart seems to be like the governing organ in our body that kind of makes our energy bubble. So I'd love to understand a little bit more of how you, both of you see this, well, information, but also this feeling and this intuitive knowledge kind of to permeate society. Because I feel like we've been coming from an age of logic. We're in the information age where everything is zeros and ones. And clearly, if you look around the world, what, what we want more of is connection. And I feel when I think of connection, I think of heart. So where does it land for the two of you? Let me follow up a little bit on what you and, and Deborah both said about science. Um, when we started Heart Math, you know, many years ago now, uh, with Doc Shorter, our founder, um, we'd had our own experiences of heart. We knew there was an internal guidance system there. We'd been, we'd been benefiting from it. And we wanted to put it into a system, which is now the Heart Math system. Tools, techniques, and technology all underpinned with scientific research. We, we wanted to have that be mainstream. We didn't want it to stay in the respected realms of just philosophy or spirituality. That it would have, to your point, Julian, mainstream application. How would it play out in the world? So we recognized we needed to build a bridge between what had been said for a long time philosophically and spiritually about the heart down to that day-to-day -day application. And we chose science to be that bridge. Our science was never intended to take the heart out of heart. It was really to give it that empirical, solid understanding that people really do respect in today's world. And, and I think we've been very successful at doing that. Uh, a whole new view of heart came, has come about as a result of our research and associative research. Uh, right down to the physical heart level, which is what Deborah was speaking to uh, just a few minutes ago. So the goal really is, is to get people to begin to operate with more of what we call the values of the heart and how they process life, how they think, how they feel, how they act, how they interact with one another. And that gets back again to, to some concepts that we've heard about our whole life, but to me are more important today than ever before. You know, how can we be more kind? First of all, to ourselves, for starters, and in, in terms of also with others, how can we be more inclusive in our perceptions and less judgmental? You know, I think that, yes, there's a, a huge energetic, I'll call it momentum taking place in the world today of people wanting cooperation, wanting connection. At the same time, the status quo uh, up to this point has been a lot of separation, people dividing and separating through, you know, through the lens of judgment about what's right, what's wrong, who's good, who's bad. Uh, pointing out differences rather than commonalities. So I think that through the eyes of the heart, through that intelligence, we begin to see things in a more uh, connected way. And that uh, reduces the amount of separation that we really see. Certainly, I think that one of the most important characteristics of heart that we need more of in the world right now is compassion, a compassionate view of what's happening in society, recognizing that we are, in fact, living in this era of super high-speed change where the world is, is changing so quickly that it's, it's impossible to keep up with it. 
that is a great opportunity and it's something to be excited about because we are moving very quickly through an evolutionary spiral. At the same time, that much change happening that quickly creates chaos and challenges. So in the middle of all that, I think having compassion is one of the best, uh, most important heart qualities that we can demonstrate and also uh, take on for ourselves. So it becomes a matter of, can we appreciate more? Can we judge less? Can we be kinder? Can we have more compassion? Can we do those things moment to moment, day to day with more consistency? And what happens then, uh, Julian, is it opens us up to more of these higher aspects of heart, like more intuition. But it comes from, from, from doing the, the basics, the simple things. And if society begins to do that more and more, what happens is, is the values change, the actual psychological paradigms that we draw from to create and structure what we call reality begin to change and morph. So we begin to want something different and that's happening. We see that, you know, and it's uh, there's a movement, there's a growing hunger for change Absolutely. Uh, and that's already taking place. So as that begins to occur, it begins to draw and demand new solutions to old problems. It sets up new systems, new ways of doing things, new values come into play. All of that happens. And it, it happens when we begin to rekindle something we already have inside, which is our own best friend here, our heart. And then manifesting those qualities in daily life with consistency, which leads to the other things that I just mentioned. So yeah. I mean, I love how you, you name it but, your own best friend. I, I find that very charming because I guess this is something we're, we're hearing so much about meditation and all these practices should guide you and lead you to more self-love. But then how does it actually look? And um, this kind of bridge to see my own heart as my own best friend and also this feeling of kindness and compassion because when we feel it, it, it is true, right? We, we experience almost like um, an ecstasy of, of endorphins. It's like, yeah, the moment I'm, I'm forgiving someone for a small action um, and I, I, I instead just feel love, there is something that, that heightens my entire awareness, which then, as you say, it kind of leads me to intuition. Um, so, yeah, I'm, That's right. I'm, I'm taking that. my own best friend. I love that. Now, we're going to have times in our lives very often where we don't feel like we're good enough. Uh, we feel like we haven't done enough or we feel like we've made too many mistakes and all these different things. And that results in these feelings of self-judgment. You know, and when I find myself there, I try to remember that I have this best friend and I go back and say, it's okay, little dude, it's all right. You know, everybody's going through challenges. This is a tough day or a tough moment in time, but then try to find that self-compassion. Once I've done that, then it's much easier for me to give compassion to someone else. Right. Uh, with, without that, it's, it's not as easy, but then I can have a more compassionate view of others' lives and of the world, but it begins with that, you know, that connection to that part of myself uh, that, that resides in the heart. Beautiful. Deborah, how is it for you? How do you, um, how do you practice like this self-love and this like individual coherence on a daily basis? Because I think that's when it turns really real is how do we do it day by day? And then maybe even moment to moment, because we all know there are days when things go well and better, and then there's something small that upsets us. So how do you kind of reset into this place of coherence? Great question. You know, you mentioned coherence. So let me just say for a moment that coherence is not just an abstract concept. When we look at the physical heart that is beating all the time, nonstop from birth to death, and that heart is beating at us different heart rates. And one of the research breakthroughs at HeartMath Institute was to plot out heart rate changes beat to beat to beat to beat, not over a minute, which is an average, but each beat, and then look and see what that looked like, you know, with the pulse sensor and checking our heart rate, but it's called heart rate variability, which is the rhythm pattern of the heart rate, beat to beat to beat. And what we found is when you're frustrated, stressed, anxious, worried, triggered, you, like you said, you've been going along in a flow and all of a sudden you're triggered. The heart rhythm pattern gets very jagged and irregular like an earthquake. And the more angry or upset or worried or anxious, the more earthquake it looks. And when you're feeling these qualities, these attributes of the heart, genuine compassion for yourself or others or love or care or that heart connection and a warm hearted feeling, what you've described, the when we get in touch here, that's uplifting feelings of the endorphins or whatever it is that's making us feel good inside. It starts with the heart rate variability pattern changing into a very smooth, coherent waveform. And the more genuinely you feel that love or kindness or patience, 
the more that waveform looks like a beautiful harmonic mirroring again how we feel inside. And so either one of those patterns of the, the jagged or regular stress pattern or the smooth heart wave when you're feeling in the qualities of the heart, the heart sends that to the brain upstairs and says, here's how the body feels. Now produce the hormones, the reactions, the, you know, the memories that are associated with that. And so what we found is that when you're feeling love and care, <clears throat> then you can switch from that jagged matter, pattern, like you said, what do I do? How do I get coherent when I'm triggered? To send a different signal to my brain, that's going to open up higher cognitive functions so I can see a new solution to the problem that just triggered me. This is really important because not only can we change our mood and how we feel in the moment, we can take those triggers and a little, it takes a little practice but bring them back to the heart and shift the heart rhythm pattern, which will send a different signal to the brain. And instead of triggering thing, oh, that person just did something negative to me and judge them and feel hurt and betrayed, we might get a different signal, like a bigger perspective and say, hey, that person's really having a hard time today. Don't personalize it. Don't, you, know, you don't have to take it in as a he did something to you. And that can make all the difference in how we treat each other in the workplace, in the home, and in the world, because so much of what goes on in the stress bath of this world is people projecting and interpreting what others are thinking or feeling and not really knowing or understanding what it is they really are feeling. And to me, compassion is that doorway, that activation of the heart that can help us pause and really feel or understand or gain some light on where another person is at without having to project or, or get into sympathy and over identity with them. It's a very, very powerful heart attribute. And I feel people are called to it. It's like we all kind of know this inside. We've been there. We all know what I'm talking about. Right. But we need tools to make those shifts in the moment. And that's what HeartMaps has developed, the whole skill set. And that's what I use. That's what everybody in the HeartMath companies use. Very specific techniques to shift pause, shift to the heart, activate genuinely a heart rhythm pattern. That means activating a feeling of calm or patience or ease or appreciation for your pet or it doesn't matter what, and then allow the heart and brain to sync up and allow yourself to get some new perspectives about anything in life, the intuitive flow. That's powerful. That's why the mission of HeartMath is to help activate the heart of humanity, because it's not just all loving each other, which is the foundation, care and loving ourselves, but it's activating that higher intelligence that we call heart intelligence that comes in when we do have love, compassion, care, forgiveness, kindness of ourselves and others. Right. Wow, that, that's, that's a beautiful kind of vision to see that humanity has the, the possibility to kind of go towards this state of existence where we feel that kind of love with each other and are aware enough to realize it starts with having our own best friend and it starts with practicing this place of coherence. What, what do we do about fear though, you guys? I mean, fear is an emotion that every person experiences. Some fear is real, like the famous saber-toothed tiger example. Something comes into your reality and you actually have to be afraid in order to mobilize yourself and leave. Um, but then there's so much fear that is kind of a projection of the mind and right. a state of worry. So yeah, where, where does that come to play? Well, let me answer that as a psychologist too. And plus what we've studied at HeartMath, fear is a survival mechanism to protect us. And as we start practicing what I'm talking about on the little stresses, the little anxieties, the frustrations, the impatience, the anger, we start to build the resilience and build the power of our heart. And we start to build new perspectives. So the things that may have seized us or gripped us in fear start to lessen and then as we build that self-empowerment, that self-regulation capacity on those little things, we begin to have when a fear rises, an insecurity rises, we begin to go, oh, wait a minute. And we take that back to the heart and we may get a bigger perspective that allows us to help transform that fear into new views and empowerment. But deeply seated cellular fears especially about what might be happening in the world or your child or all sorts of fears, we learn how to reduce it to manage concern. You know, you're not going to wipe it out, but you can reduce the fear as you practice little by little with these heart 
coherent tools so that you can have more of a managed concern and then you can start to get the clearer perspectives that you want of how to move through that fear or the next steps. It's a process. None of this is going to be wave a magic wand and it's overnight. It's a building process of our own coherence, of our own changing our baseline reactions, building our self-empowerment, building our self-regulatory capacity. And what is beautiful about it is it all has a positive feedback. It's self-soothing. There's a confirmation. Yes, I'm on the right path. Yes, this is something that is powering that I want to do more of. And then we begin to see that the old ways of reacting really, we know where they're going to go. So we start getting more heart intelligence, smart enough to go, you know, I'm going to say no to that and go this way. And it's a process of uh, that to me is the awakening of the next level of human evolution is awakening that higher intelligence to enable us to move through the standard fears. And of course, if something is really chasing you and you're in danger, you need the fear response, right? Howard, is there anything you want to add on the topic of fear or how does that, how does it look for you? Well, no, but I, I, I think Deborah's answer is very comprehensive. We'll leave that one at that. I would like to say to the listeners, and this is not a, a, a in any, in any way a way to, to promote a book, but there's some great information in the newest heart math book, Heart Intelligence. Uh, one of the other co-authors on that is heart, Doc Childry, the founder of Heart Math, and he wrote some really great things about fear in there that I think could help people. So I just want to say there's a reference mm -hmm. you can go back to. Yeah, I can, um, I can yeah. echo that. I, I've read your book, and so fear is, fear is certainly something we, we all experience. And I've also, at the same time as reading the book, I've worked with um, the inner, uh, inner balance sensor, which is like a, a clip you have on your ear, and then through your, through your smartphone, you kind of like, learn to understand when you're breathing in the space of coherence. And the first thing that I found really remarkable was once I saw in the app, I am in coherence, what I remembered most was how I felt at that moment. Right. That's right. And then no matter where I actually go in my like day-to-day -day life, I can just check in. How, how does it feel? Do I feel like in this upper part of my chest where things seem to be effortless, where even when somebody does something, um, for example, I, I, little short anecdote, I, I went, um, I traveled to the United States, I'm, I live in Canada, and I had to go through border control, and I was selected as one of the people that got screened, and you know how there's like an intimidation tactic going on, and um, it just made me smile, I, I just had a, a zero fear or problem with it, first of all, I had nothing to hide, but then second, I just became aware of instantly, where is my breathing at, where is my coherence right now, mm -hmm. and um, I actually ended up having a great chat with the border officer and we exchanged smiles and compliments and then I left. So it really changed the entire energy and wow. the situation. It's good. Just think what would happen if we could learn these simple science-based techniques because science and the fact that the research shows if you shift focus to your heart and do coherent breathing like you did, it's going to have all these benefits on perception, on health, on performance, on relationships and communication. I mean, there's, it, it, it puts us in sync or in, in resonance with life. Yeah. And if science is saying that, then more and more people are going to be less afraid to connect with the heart. You know, we do a lot of work with engineers and our training programs, Heart Master Certified Training, and with the military and law enforcement and all aspects of life. And often we will share the science first so they can understand the role of the heart and what it's doing. It's not just a blood pump. And that means they go, okay, it's not just a soft, squishy thing you're asking me to shift to my heart. I don't have to be afraid because I've been hurt. I can actually just start to shift the heart rhythm pattern and find a calmer, more patient, more resilient place. And most people have a reference like you did. You know, whether the reference is like when we work with the military, it's, it's a sense of honor of being able to serve. That is a heart feeling that can be a reference that can add more compassion and care to your quality of interactions, as well as your sense of service and duty. And every single person has a reference, whether it's how you felt about your puppy when you were three years old or your child when they just were born or... This is finding what that place that touches your heart is so that when you see it brings you into that heart coherent rhythm on the inner balance app with your pulse center, you go, that's confirmation. And that becomes just the stepping stone to opening up more of your frontal lobes, your intuition, your higher intelligence to make better decisions, not just at the end of the day when you meditate or when you practice mindfulness, but moment to moment to moment to moment. And again, it takes practice. Nobody's perfect, but you increase your ratios, as we call it in heart math, 
and life keeps getting better. And so I, you know, I, I watched the Super Bowl the other day and watched the commercials. And I was amazed at how many of them were touching the heart. You know, how many of them were about, were all connected and how important it is for us to know that we can really help each other. And that is indicative of a big awakening of the heart because you just watch those and it warms your heart Absolutely. differently than others. It's very interesting what you just mentioned about commercials touching our heart. I think we, we know from sales techniques or marketing techniques, hundreds of years actually, no matter how far we go back in human society, that when you touch somebody's emotional center, you, you kind of get them to have a reaction, right? What I find so interesting, as you say, we're in, the, in these commercials, now people talk about how one we are. I think we're emer emerging into a technological era where it's it's becoming evident to everyone how we are connected on one green and blue planet because we're all sharing at least the internet together i think right now we have about half of the world's population online um for for a fact people are very positive that in the next 10 years we'll have 7 billion people online so the the oneness is not just an esoteric concept at that point right. but actually physical reality so what strikes me very um interesting about the heart math uh, work that, that both of you are, are so committed to is that you're really merging technology and the feedback we get from technology right. with daily practice of heart of meditation of prayer of gratitude and yeah so what what kind of made that click for both of you that technology is a, an essential tool that can possibly help people raise an awareness well, to me technology is an outgrowth of consciousness i mean new technology shows up because of something that we need you know some of us are about physical convenience but technology is now coming into play that helps us on the inside you know, the inside out job of uh, of living our lives technology for us was an outgrowth of our scientific research once we understood heart rate variability which never mentioned its importance what it could show us about ourselves physiologically and psychologically we recognize that developing technology to assist people uh, in finding you know, that connection to their hearts, but in a very pragmatic and scientific way they could accept, that would be important. You mentioned when you use the inner balance trainer, that it's about how you, you begin to recognize the feeling associated with a higher state of coherence. Once you've recognized that, you can replicate that more in your daily life, moment to moment. That creates what we call at HeartMath a new coherence baseline, which means we operate more consistently there anyhow. So we change. We change as human beings. So our technology was, again, born out of our scientific research, designed as an assistive technology to assist people to find more balance, more poise, less stress, more heart qualities in their lives. Now, that, I think, in the world we live in today is important and useful. It contextualizes what what people need and what we do in ways in which they are open to acceptance. Uh, technology is being used all over the place by everybody and it's probably being overused in many cases. But uh, having technologies that can assist people to find more balance and peace in their life <clears throat> made sense to us. That was the click. We had the science to support it. We had a tremendous amount of experience in it. Our training programs that we've been doing for many years gave us an understanding of the needs that people had and then we can put some technology in along with all of those other tools and have a really cool package that made sense for people, you know, in, uh, in this new millennium. Yeah, interesting, because you're mentioning that <laughs> some people might even overuse technology at this point, right? And as we're talking about hard intelligence and how this kind of uh, plays into a societal evolution, I think for a lot of people right now, there is this question mark about technology and whether it's dangerous or whether we're getting lost in technology and I find uh, your work really represents kind of the middle path of uh, everything that's more to do with the mindful world and the natural world and also knowing our own body and really knowing that consciousness is an inside journey. Like it actually starts when I close my eyes. Everything starts on the inside and the technology and the outside world are, they're just a reflection to it. So kind of bringing them into balance, I guess, is, is the mission we're, we're on. Um, it's pretty, it's a lot of work to do there, but uh, <laughs> but certainly, you know, we're doing what we can, you know, through um, the type of, uh, of offerings we have. Yeah. You know, it, what you're seeing in the inner balance, it's called that too, is it's the autonomic balance of your autonomic nervous system. You practice that, you gain more nervous system balance, as well as this heart-brain intuitive connection to make better choices it has a carryover effect, like you're saying, the reference is there so you can carry it with you in your interactions. 
But think about this too. You're into it. Certainly works this way for me. I like that feeling. I want to sustain it. And if I get too much in my head and like I'm spending too much time with emails or in social media, I get the feedback. You become more sensitive. You go, that's enough. So the whole idea is inner balance leads to your own inner guidance to what outer balance is for you, whether it's work-life balance, whether it's technology and communication with a live person balance. That inside out is the key because we're never going to find it outside in. And the inner balance technology is giving you the mirror to help you refine when you're in the zone and when you're not. So you can stay there more and be inner directed to more quality of life and more fulfillment in the higher quality states of what you want. So imagine that technology connecting people through the internet. Imagine people being connected in the heart together and really knowing they are. That could be very powerful. And I see that's where the potential is, where we're going with this inner technology. I agree too, Julian, with Jabra, because right now there are this conversation because of technology, uh, because of the, of the Facebook stream that we have happening and all of that. And your generation, too, with how we create new tools for social conscious change. So there's an upside to anything. It's all about how we use it. Yeah, absolutely. I think uh, you mentioning also the generations, of course, anybody under, I believe, 30, which is more than half of the world's population, grew up with basically the internet as part of their daily life um, and technology being really intertwined in the daily life. But I think nevertheless, we're equally as overwhelmed with where it has taken us. Yeah. And I think it's really a, a, a manner or matter of awakening to um, where's the balance in that? Because it's probably individually different. For some people, it might be much more essential to spend time in nature. Um, for other people, it might be totally fine to spend hours and hours in front of a screen and create more technology. But I, I, I'm with you on that, Deborah, that I can, I can envision a, a reality where we could possibly um, have this feedback intertwined. So anytime I'm on a laptop, like, like right now, I, can, I, I get an instant feedback of this is where your heart rate variability is at. This is, this is how much you are in flow. This is how much you are in the zone. I have a question to the word of flow and zone like would you say this is synonymous with being in a state of gratitude well it depends on how you define flow and zone and gratitude and there's lots of definitions of flow from the kind of flow that a skier or an athlete can get into which the inner balance coherence state is sort of like a prep state or ready state for whatever else might magically happen in the brain we don't really know all the neurochemicals that are induced by that kind of physical activity with the, putting your heart into it and how that generates flow or the zone, what an athlete would call being in the zone. So we look at coherence as the first level of flow or zone where your mind, your emotions, your body are in sync, in resonance. They're, so your intuition can flow, your, your inner sense of knowing what to do next can flow. And that in itself is incredibly rewarding to have that happening to you. And everything else kind of flows, flows from there in terms of your perception of what's balanced or your sensitivity to a loved one and, or how you, how you apply uh, your efforts at work or anything. You just have a lot more access to information that's beneficial to you and that can guide you. That's why we call the subtitle of the book Heart intelligence connecting with the intuitive guidance of the heart. It's a high speed intelligence, as Howard said, that just cuts through a lot of stuff and you don't need to use the analytical mind always. You use that to gather data, but you want to really use your heart intelligence to do a high speed sort of what feels right for, for the situation. And the heart knows in high speed normally even before things occur, if I remember that. Well, that's what the research is indicating that when there's, and this study has been replicated a number of times, that when a computer randomly selects pictures in person, the subject is wired up by brain waves, heart rhythms, heart waves, everything, that it appears that the heart will know the nature of the picture, whether it's a positive affect 
picture makes you feel good like bunny rabbits or whether it is a stress producing picture like gory scenes. And the heart knows that. And so it appears to be actually accessing a field of information beyond time and space. It somehow knows before the computer even randomly chooses the picture. Now, that shouldn't surprise us because there's so much going on quantum computing and quantum entanglement now that there's possibilities. But how the heart is accessing that, that's a whole other field of research. And then the heart signals the brain, which also is before the computer chooses. And then the brain signals the body. So as we become, the practical value of that to us, day to day, moment to moment, is as we learn to tune into our heart. Think of it as a radio receiver and broadcaster. We start to tune more to what is the best action or the highest best for ourselves or others in that moment. As we have that peaceful, calm, loving, kind, patient feeling, the qualities of the heart or gratitude you asked about. If gratitude and appreciation are qualities and attitudes that activate heart coherence, sometimes quicker than any other quality, because it's easiest to feel it. We usually all have something we're grateful for and we can feel it genuinely. And so that can give us more access to that intuitive guidance moment to moment. We call that practical intuition because where intuition is valuable is how it helps us make higher, better choices and decisions as we weigh them, what choice should I make moment to moment? And we start to see, ah, that worked, that worked. That's good, I'm gonna do more of that. Yeah, so when we, when we talk about this higher intuition and tapping into this increased activity of the frontal lobe and just the, let's, let's just call it the full human almost, right? So we're, we're moving out of doubt and out of worry and out of this obsession in our minds and um, our in, in coherence and the picture that I, I see, I see you draw is a, a picture not just of individual coherence, but then of group coherence or even of global coherence. Right. So as we're evolving as a society, what besides the the hard rate variability, what what do you what do you guys think of us moving into a purpose society, and what role um, do we play into actively creating this purpose society? First of all, Julian, I think that you know hard is where we really get an understanding of our true purpose, not an assumed one or not one that's just born from ambition, but we get a sense of what our purpose really is. And so it goes right back to the, 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 the nature of our conversation today is when we're in that place to sort of step into manifesting our purpose, to actually doing what it takes, actions and activities. Sometimes it means not doing things. Uh, it can be the ability to discriminate how best to, and the sort of the, the impetus and courage to manifest our purpose. Now, that is contagious. Uh, as one person does it, another kind of gets onto it. They want some of that too. And they begin to, uh, to look at how they can either model that or develop something on their own that relates to purpose. So what's happening is that, you know, we are all living in this field of, of, of energy that's reflecting back to us, not just what we think up here, but what we feel in here. And science is, is, is showing that, you know, we are in a sense co-creating what we call our reality. And science is also showing that we are all connected at some level, that there's an energetic connection happening between all living systems. So we're communicating and exchanging in, in ways that are, that are often unseen. And that's how movements and momentum start to take hold, right? When there's a common shared purpose that people sort of buy into, it sort of spreads really quickly and can result in a lot of positive change. That's already again happening. I think it will increase. I think that, you know, um, there's a movement of, change in purpose of individually and collectively that is already in play right now. How do we, how do we facilitate that? How do we accentuate it? Well, again, it's, it's what we can add to it and how we can contribute to that, but it will happen. It's contagious. I mean, that's the way change and mass change uh, usually takes place. It's a small group of people, small number of people get onto something and it makes sense and resonates with others. And then it spreads. And I think it, uh, moving towards a higher purpose, uh, consciousness is part of what we're going through right now and it will result in a new and very different world uh, somewhere down the road. Deborah, do you want to touch on purpose as a topic? Sure. You know, um, as I connect with the heart more and more, I really do believe that every being has a similar purpose, which is here to serve others, to help others, because then you're helping yourself. It is the higher selfness, selfishness that is programmed into every, every cell. And it's uncovering that, that that's where you're going to come out the most 
is if you are here to help your fellow man. And it's been said through every tradition and religion, but try to imagine a world where everyone found their unique purpose within that, because it would be different ways that we'd all do it. And if everybody was just helping one other person, but knew that their purpose was to do that, was to care, you know, was to help themselves and others and did that from the heart, you would have a huge, a massive expansion of love on this planet. All half the problems that we have would be gone because they're, they're there because of self-centered greed and nobody, not enough people caring. And so purpose for me is totally to serve humanity, to awaken the heart. And someone else may have a purpose of inspiring humanity to open the heart through music or to be a doctor or to heal, to lessen suffering in some way. But there is a gazillion purposes once we align with our own heart and start listening to our heart and following our heart, our purpose unfolds. And it's always in relation to our connection with others in some way because we are all connected, not separate. And so as we awaken to that more and more, then there can be a whole awakening of higher purpose among millions of people. And then I can't even imagine what a beautiful planet this will be. And we see this happening already, the way people are caring for each other after hurricanes and floods and fires. And it goes on and on. Every Even moves, news stories now in the mainstream media talk about inspiring America. And there is a hard awakening and people are most fulfilled when they're operating from that place. And it is contagious because we want that for ourselves, our children and each other. And so I think it's extremely hopeful that we can help each other find that, that heart purpose. Yeah, beautiful. I, I can see that as well. What I find interesting is, as you mentioned, that the moment that there are um, bigger problems occurring or supernatural problems like uh, hurricanes or earthquakes, et cetera, there's already this willingness to instantly jump into the, the place of heart and help and yes. see how they can be of service. So um, the question I have on my own, uh, in my own mind is, is it really only then that we can see how beautiful and fruitful collaboration can actually be? Or is it also that we can gradually kind of go towards more and more um, awake and aware heart coherence and from that place kind of create a, a reality that, that let's, let's be honest, that works for everyone because currently it is, um, it's quite an unbalanced world we still live in. And we, we know that we're going towards a, a technological evolution and revolution, like the fourth industrial revolution, I think it's, it's called, where millions of people, hundreds of millions of people will lose their jobs due to automation, which might occur as a risk or um, a threat to a lot of them. But I think it also can possibly be seen as an opportunity to say, what is that higher purpose, this, this higher form of caring that we can evolve into? That's right. Yeah. It's happening. It's unfolding. Again, if I didn't see so much heart awakening happening in, throughout society at the same time as I see the crazy political situation going on, more and more people are getting disgusted with that. All these forces, dynamics work together. The technology revolution, this whole new thing of cyber currency that's supposed to revolutionize the whole economic state. The new science that is saying, hey, wellness is what you want to focus on, not just trying to deal with disease after the fact. Right. And prevention and wellness, hey, here's the data. And not only is it about the traditional things we hear about, but this new understanding of the power of the heart is like, wow, it's confirming for people. So all of this is happening at the same time. And then we watch the news after a hurricane, and maybe that's also some big design that there's one after the other, after the other of natural disasters. And you see this firefighter who just spent the last 36 hours up saving and rescuing people and telling the whole United States watching audience on a major channel, this was the most fulfilling day of my life. Now, why is that? So then you have the younger generation who are already waking up to a lot of this and won't stand for it. Yeah. You know, so all these forces working together, it's up to each of us to see how we can contribute, how we can co-create, how we can manage ourselves, which it comes back to what do we do when we're frustrated and angry and feeling separate or hurt? 
how do we manage that so we get back into our higher heart and what are the tools that can help us do that absolutely so what are tools or nuggets of wisdom that the, the two of you would pass on to let's say an apprentice in your field like if each of you could name maybe like two or three things that you're like this is something i've learned over the journey of uh, high intelligence or the journey of my life that really um if you apply it you will get to the place of just of, of, of purpose maybe a lot a lot easier well i can give a couple um again they're pretty simple but if you do them with authenticity it's good. it can work right you know so one would be first of all I, I talked about this earlier in our conversation please be, begin to have a little bit more compassion for yourself right so recognize you know that you know things aren't all bad you know get, get off your own back a little bit have that sense of compassion for you secondly try to consciously activate as much as you can a feeling of appreciation now everything's evolving and some things that we've learned about before are also evolving and moving up sort of an evolutionary spiral so people know about appreciation they know about gratitude they've done gratitude journals all of that that's all very good now i suggest that we learn to activate appreciation even more and more a heart math term that would relate to this would be called turning up the edges when something happens learn to sort of shift it the other direction appreciation is a tool that can do that uh, you have to look for things to appreciate you have to look for the good things that are taking place in your life you have to look for things that are happening in the world that you can see as forward momentum in a certain way that you can appreciate there's always something there that, that can be appreciated. And when we do that and we begin to string those moments together and turn the edges up, we begin to sort of moment to moment, day to day, recreate our current life and our future. That's something I would suggest to somebody that was, that was, that, was, that I was talking to that was new to this. The last thing I will say is learn to trust your intuition. See it as practical, not as mystical, learn to access, uh, a field of information that's always there become more sensitive to it and learn to trust it trust your intuition trust your your really heart-based instincts uh in how you make decisions in life and try to and try to do it in, from a place where you're you're not afraid you know be willing to step outside yourself a little bit and go for it so compassion for yourself appreciate learn to activate appreciation and learn to trust your intuition would be three things that i would would offer someone if i was talking to them about keys for that have helped me in my life. Powerful. What about you, Deborah? Um, I would say that learning to just do what we call attitude breathing, become more conscious of your breathing through the heart area, though. Uh, there's lots of other breathing techniques, but for purposes of finding flow in the day to day and moving in more of that graceful poised state and being able to come back to the heart more quickly when you get triggered, is focusing in the heart and at different times in the day, breathe qualities of like ease, breathe the sense of relaxation and ease or breathe calm when you don't feel calm or breathe patience. That really does help bring that feeling in. So it's not just conceptual, you know, and breathe gratitude, be grateful. And it's practicing these things that can keep us more attuned to the intuitive guidance of the heart which can guide us to our next step or our next approach or next thing to do even on our to-do list. That's a higher priority. I also find that if I've gotten myself out of sorts, sometimes I have to just sit myself down and really ask my heart how to turn that around or turn the edges up, as Howard said. So it's commitment to really utilizing your heart as your best friend or your guide and then following it, listening and following the best you can. And it refines as you do it more. The voice of the heart or the signal gets louder and clearer. And you know it because it's like, that felt right. This feels like I'm going to run into an electrical fence, so I'm not going to go that way. You know, you start to understand the bodies and the feeling world signals because they all have information for you. And so I would say um, practice, you know, whether it's heart math or some other system, start to connect more with your heart and if it starts to feel old painful stuff come up <laughs> passion have that kindness as you do that you'll start to release it because there's a huge shift happening on the planet right now it's much easier as everything's speeding up now and we're becoming more one in this energetic field to have 
our acceleration of moving through old stuff that used to be years and years of processing and healing, all that can move a lot more quickly now. And it is. And so referencing the heart helps us stay on that, on that highway. Cool. Why, why don't you take us on that highway of a breath uh, practice as, as we're live here? Um, okay. Everybody all right. Like, it's a call quick coherence to bring our heart rhythms into that harmonious co coherence and we're going to do it together because the heart does connect with each other in that harmonious rhythm so let's focus our attention in the area of the heart you like your mind is in your heart area pretend like your breath is flowing in through the area of the heart and out through the area of the heart a little more slowly a little more deeply than normal as you continue this heart focused breathing just activate a genuine feeling or attitude of appreciation or gratitude. It could be for a person, a pet, a time in nature. Whatever gives you that quicker feeling of gratitude or appreciation as you're breathing in through the heart and out through the heart. Know that you can do this anytime, anywhere, by taking that one minute quick coherence break to shift to the heart and activate gratitude in your heart rhythms. If you were hooked up to our inner balance technology, it would show you moving into more coherent rhythm. I'll add one more step before we close this part. Let's just appreciate each other. Appreciate yourself and appreciate each other's hearts. And that we're all awakening to the connection and power and intelligence of our hearts. Let's appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you for guiding this. I, I love taking this time to, in a group, um, also while we're on a live, to kind of share a moment of meditation. I think those small moments make all the difference. Um, Howard and Deborah, I have one more question for the two of you before we end this, uh, this interview in this Facebook Live. Um, and this is a question that is, we kind of touched on it. We were talking about societal evolution and where we're going towards. But I'd really love to hear from you. What do you think is required or necessary for humanity to go into this direction? And what is like a 200 year vision for planet Earth that both of you have in your heart? Well, it's a good question, Julian. Certainly, um, I don't have a, a, just a ready answer and something um, we'd like, you know, I'll often ponder. I think, you know, it's difficult for me to see 200 years down the road. I think where we are is we're at this really interesting place where a whole new world is going to emerge, unlike anything we've, we've ever seen, really. But we can't see it quite yet. And I get this, uh, sometimes I get asked a question in the interview, you talk about a new world emerging, what's it going to be like? And my answer to that is genuine. It says, I don't really know. Um, and because I don't think we can see around the corner yet, you know, we're, we're still having to do this inner work just to get you know, solid in ourselves to move out of, you know, uh, some of the old patients we placed upon ourselves and begin to dissolve some of the separation, you know, that we have before we can actually see around that corner. But I do think that we are going to be manifesting a world and it will happen quicker than people think in many ways that operates uh, from a position of really a much more inclusiveness. I talked about it earlier where cooperation is, is shifts into a whole new paradigm where it's, it becomes the, the status quo rather than competition. And I know that sounds like a big leap, but as I said, I think something new and different, unlike anything we've ever seen before is coming. Uh, so we move into an era where, where there's a sense of cooperation that could be forced even by, you know, by naturally occurring causes that we have to think that way, but something will get us there to where we look, we, we learn to work together to where we learn to get along in a new way where there's another degree of, of, of enthusiastic acceptance, not just passive acceptance, that allows people to want to embrace the differences, uh, whether, you know, whatever differences they are. 
And then as a result of that, we begin to solve some problems that I think are fundamental to you to, to, to where we are today as a global society. One of those that I see is reduction of poverty. I see poverty as being the root cause of so many other problems. And I, I think that when you can get people to a place where their basic needs are taken care of, it allows the human spirit to unfold in a new way. Uh, and I think that this disparity between you know, people who have and people who don't is becoming wider and wider. And in the new world that I see, that begins to lessen and it comes together more. And it comes through more of an understanding of taking care of the whole, that we are one, one family, really, in, on one planet. And we will need to work together and want to work together to make sure that everybody has got their basic needs covered and allows for the human spirit to, to soar. You mentioned earlier technology coming that will replace many jobs. And that is a concern in the short term. I read a book by a guy named Kevin Kelly, uh, who talked about all new, new technology. And his perspective on it was, is that short term, we are going to see huge issues with that. Long term, it's going to free us <laughs> from doing so many of the mundane tasks that we really are designed. We were designed to do something a lot more than that. And at the end of the day, a new human will emerge as a result of that, one that is manifesting its creativity, its higher principles, its purpose, all those wonderful qualities that we have as hum human beings that are unique to us. So I think in the new world, down the road, we'll see the cooperation increase, we'll see wholeness increase, we'll see the reduction of poverty begin to take place, and we'll see the human spirit begin to emerge in, in a new way that, that ushers in creativity, that creates a everything from new technology to new ways of living to new ways of thinking that are unlike anything we've ever seen before and will be magnificent and beautiful. Well, I love what Howard said and I would- Yeah, me too. <laughs> my vision is, and it's, it, it's not idealistic, as, I, as more and more people begin to activate this heart coherence, it creates an energetic field. I mean, we've already measured that when your heart rhythm is in that coherent waveform, it's radiating, broadcasting like a radio wave that can be picked up in other people's brain waves. And that affects the room. You know, just like when you walk in a room and someone's been, people have been arguing and you kind of feel the vibe, or you walk into a room where two people have been really warmly, deeply engaging and you feel uplifted. Right. We communicate energetically to each other. So, as we start to consciously activate heart intelligence, I do feel it's going to manage artificial intelligence. So many people are scared of AI and it's going to take over the world and take over people. But that's like the brain projecting what the brain that's more developed might do. It's not relating to the power we have in terms of our heart and soul and spirit to have more wisdom to guide that process. And I see that unfolding and all of it working together and more of like an intua technology as we come together and this heart awakening keeps occurring. And so I feel like it will be affecting each other with this coherence momentum, this coherence wave, which is why we're doing research at the Heart Math Institute and the Global Coherence Initiative, seeing how the energetic fields of the earth affect our heart rhythms and how can be, and how we possibly can become one with and resonant with planet Earth and all of humanity to really accelerate this, this oneness connection, which is, starts in the heart and encompasses everything. Thank you both for this, for this very in-depth answer. And I, I love both of your answers. And I feel this is truly the, the work uh, of the Heart Math Institute that, that really captures my attention, my heart's attention, but also my mind is to take the intelligence of the heart and the, the concept of oneness out of the, the mystical or esoteric and into the practical and into the awareness of everyday consciousness. Right. Yes, I want to invite everyone to, uh, I believe you're going to give a link where they can go to the heartmath.com website and download a free chapter of the Heart Intelligence book, see if it's something you want to read more of. And uh, we'll provide that to you. But uh, just so we'll, we'll share the link with you guys below if it ha hasn't been shared yet. And um, once again, thank you so much, Martin. Thank you so much, uh, Howard. Sorry. And thank you so much, Deborah, for being on the show. And thank you for um, taking the time to really dive deep about heart intelligence and just what it, what it takes to be in this place every day. Because I think that's what it matters. It's not to intellectually understand, but to embody it every, every day. Well, thank you, Julian. Thank you, everybody, for listening, for your time and attention. I hope that people who have 
listen to our conversation have come away with something that can be meaningful and practical for them uh, to help improve their lives. And if that happens and we've done our job today and it's certainly been enjoyable to be with you again uh, and to be with Deborah. Thank you so much. Take care.